I love God so much. <laughs> Isn't he wonderful? I, oh, my goodness. I love him so much. And you know what? In a relationship, husband and wife, it's not a one-sided deal. And it never has been. Every day, and I know she doesn't get tired of it. I tell her how she's, she's out so I can talk. <laughs> I tell her how cute she is, Laura. How wonderful. Hey, your hair looks sassy today. She's like, what? What? It's never one-sided. But you know what? There's, there's not a, a better spouse, another helpmate than my wife. And her job as caretaker of her husband, she spoils me. She picks out my clothes. You know that because I'm color challenged. Some say color stupid, but I refuse to listen to that. Sometimes I get it right. Sometimes I get this. Ah! And, and I'm being serious. There's, it's never one-sided in a relationship. It's you give 100% of your love, your gratitude, your attention to your spouse and expect nothing in return. Expect nothing. Because if you give 100% and you pour out and you pour out and you pour out, guess what? You're going to get it back. And more. So the same is with our God. All He wants from us, and you hear it almost every Sunday, is, is us. He just wants us. To say us is surrender slash servanthood or servanthood slash surrender. It's, it's all about the DNA and where it comes from. It's all about servanthood. It goes back to the very beginning. I will give all expecting nothing, God, because you deserve it. You deserve my attention, my love, my gratitude, God, and my prayers. Say, well, I pray, yeah, when I need something. How about praying just because you love God? I love you, Father. I love you, Father. Thank you for everything that you've given me. Thank you, God, for my family and my, my life, my, my health, God. Even if we don't see it, we, we can believe it because his word says so. Amen. Um, I went up, most of you don't know, I went up to visit uh, Tommy this morning. I actually visit to stand in with Lori. Uh, Tommy had surgery. I got a phone call last night about, or text message last night about nine o'clock, somewhere in there. And they were, they were going to go in and operate this morning early at six o'clock and put stents in his kidneys in the tube outside of his kidneys because they were beginning to fail. And what this is, it's, it's putting out a fire so that they can put out a fire. And so the surgery went well. Lori did great. Um, we're just believing. I didn't get a chance to see Tommy because they upped it to surgery was at 6. And I didn't get there till 6.30, so they had already started prepping him for surgery, and I didn't get to go in and pray with him, but I prayed with the family. And so right, right now, let's stand to your feet. Let's, let's just agree together. There is so much power in this house today. There is so much power. God gave us prayer as a gift. And you know, right now, I don't want to lead this prayer. I want you to lead this prayer individually and lift Tommy and Lori up right now for healing. Brother Dave, we stood in the, today for, for, for our brother and just believing for complete healing. We're just going to confirm what's already been done. So right now, begin to pray for Tommy that the enemy assignment be released with, against him and his family. Right now, in the name of Jesus, that anything foreign in that body, God, that doesn't belong, that it be smitten in the name of Jesus, and that assignment be broken right now, Father, right now. Healing, God, no scarring. Complete healing, God, for Tommy. Everything, God, in that body that doesn't belong. God, not just what the doctors have said. Everything, God, that's for... For creaky bones, God, that's for sore, that's for back, that's for legs, that's for knees. That's for, and restore Him in the name of Jesus. We thank You, Father. We thank You, Lord. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Okay, we talked about DNA last week, and we're going to carry that on because there's so much in-depth of what goes along with, with spiritual and biblical DNA. 
And we talked about, um, well, let me just read what, found, what DNA is. It's a foundation, we grab the specs, a foundation in all living things which determines their structure and, be, and can be re- used to uniquely identify a person. And that's what's so great about God's giftings is our spiritual DNA. Each one of us have something that only applies to us, uniquely formed us in our mother's womb, even before. And how many of you sometimes feel like you're unique, but not in the right way? <laughs> Thought that might get some eyebrows, but it did. How many of us feel like sometimes that we're, we're unique, but not in a way that we're happy with? Like you stand out in a crowd, or you're, you're so recluse that they, they name a spider after you. Or... <laughs> Alexis, S- to, to, <laughs> some of us just have difficulty. I, this, I, this is going to be hard for you to even imagine, I know. Now, I was so backward. The only time that I was forward in my actions as a youngster is if I was going to be mean to somebody. Truth. It's just truth. Why? Because I was so scarred and allowed myself to be so scarred from my upbringing with, with poking fun at this chubby little fat kid with a crippled leg and sometimes two casts, sometimes braced crutches for eight years and emotionally... I was just pulled back. I was a recluse. And so I, I used that as a crutch years and years and years and took out uh, anger, is- had anger issues and, s- and all kinds of stuff. And you know what? God knew that he, <laughs> he uniquely formed me and made me in my mother's womb. And I'm going to tell you something. God gave you your personality, strength, stability, all of the quirks that go along with your personalities. Don't try to get rid of those when you get saved because God takes those and uses them for his benefit. He gave those to you. Don't take away from your personality and your outgoing and your funny and your witty and sometimes sarcastic. Uh, in my family, if you don't have thick skin, whoo. And we love it because we know we love each other. It's part of who we are. So we, we, we found out that God uniquely made all of us just like we are. God's foundation was given every day before our mother's womb. Jeremiah, you know all that. Chapter 1, before I even formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before, he had a plan laid out exactly as we were supposed to walk. Unfortunately, those exactlys, they, they fell into sin. God had the perfect plan. You, Predestination, I absolutely believe in predestination because God set a plan. He doesn't do anything just by chance. He set a plan out for all of us and then then sin. So is God responsible for that? No, he's a loving father. He's just nurturing us and pushing us and weaving us back into where we need to be. DNA. All of us have DNA. We went into praise and worship. And how many of you like the praise and worship? Pray this is yeah, it's it's amazing. We are so gifted in, in our praise and worship. Everybody that comes is from other churches and from areas, and, and they say, Where did you come up with these people? The gifting that God has given us to never take it for granted. God has gifted us with an avenue of praise, of exalting him, an avenue of worship and falling on our face before him that we should feel privileged. When people walk in those doors and nobody else is here, I've watched them tear up and cry and never say a word. They said, God's in this house. People from off the street. Can I, can we say, hey, can, I see your church? Well, absolutely, you can see the church and go in. And now that I've seen it many, many times, now I just watch. We walk in the door and people just amazed in their eyes. They tear up. And I'm just, thank you, God. I didn't have to say a word. How privileged we are at C3. Never, ever let it die. Share it with everybody you know. Hey, you want to feel God in a house? Then come to C3. That doesn't mean steal them from other churches. That means get them saved and get them in the house. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, praise. We'll just hit that real quick. 
to make a show. <laughs> this is hilarious because I don't see it much, but we're going to. To make a show, to boast, to be glamorously foolish. Right? <laughs> Glamorous. Okay, I didn't, no amens on that one. I didn't, uh, that's right. Glamorously foolish in God's presence. To rave, to celebrate, to shine, to revere with extended hands, to cast forth or thrust with thanks. When? At all times, continually, every day, all day, where? In all places of His dominion, in the congregation of the people, in the assembly of the elders, in the sanctuary. Who? O ye saints and servants, you that stand in the house of the Lord, everything that has breath. How? So it can be heard with shouting, with singing, with joyful noise, with laughter, by lifting hands. Where did that come from? Right out of God's Word. So, we have an assignment. We've got, I got a phone call a couple weeks ago. It's scheduled for August 21st. There's going to be three gatherings and, and with, with, Cody Anderson, Pastor Cody Anderson, he's, he's my pastor in Oklahoma, and, and it has to do with TFAC, but not necessarily. That's our organization, Trinity Fellowship Association of Churches. And he said, hey, hey, Pastor Ron, he said, we're doing three conferences, gatherings, and we want to do one on the west, western Oklahoma and central Oklahoma and in eastern Oklahoma. And he said, would C3 be willing to host one of those on a Sunday night? I'm like, oh, I don't know. Let me check it. No, I didn't say that. Absolutely, we will do that. Whenever they get it put, put up on their web page and Facebook page, they're going to share it. We'll begin to advertise. And they, they, they want it structured around youth, but they want moms and dads and everybody in the congregation to come. Why? Because we're all one body. He said, what a perfect opportunity to get the kids spurred and anointed and lifted up back into, into a going to school environment with glamorous praise. Are you in? If I start dancing up here, will you jump up and dance with me? <laughs> it's going to happen. It is. God's Word doesn't lie. How can we not take that and say, you know what, I, I'm not there now. God, give me the courage. Holy Spirit, just break down the walls and the barriers of my humanity so that like David, we can dance before God's presence coming back into the house. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, worship. DNA, we're still talking about DNA. Praise is part of our DNA. God has done so much that we need to praise Him for. Worship is to bow down, to prostrate oneself before a superior in homage, to acknowledge and ascribe worth to someone or something. And that's God. To fall on our face before Him. Psalm 95, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the God our Maker for. He is our God. DNA. Okay. Now let's get so we can go a little further. First Thessalonians, how many of you want to learn more about God and His DNA of the church and our responsibilities as Christians, right? Do all of us, here's some amens, how many of you want to know really what's required of us, the Bible, God says, I, this is some things that, that I need, I require from you, and that's you. But I like it when God is very spe spe specific, <laughs> wow, specific, I did it, it was getting away from me. To be very specific. And when I, in my prayers, when I pray for somebody, I ask them specifically what is, what's the problem? What's, what needs touched? God's a God of detail. If you don't, if you don't realize that, then read about the tabernacle. It's unbelievable how detailed God is. Unbelievable. So he's, he gives us some guidelines to go by. First Thessalonians chapter one. Paul, Paul speaks to the believers and he's thanking God for the church, and, and what they had become. And wouldn't you like Apostle Paul to be saying, hey, God, they're doing fantastic. They're doing everything that you required of them. 
They're worshiping you. They're praising you. They're bringing into, into the church by the tens, by the twenties, by the thirties, by the hundreds. They're, they're converting souls, God. And C3 is doing an amazing job of, of, of God's word and accomplishing God's word. Wouldn't that be awesome? Okay. Paul and Silas and Timothy. Something stood out to them in, in chapter 1 of First Thessalonians. And first of all, I want everybody to know that every church should have DNA, but they don't have to look alike. Red hair, blonde hair, tall, thin. If you take DNA and you get a mom and dad and you get the kids, all of the DNA links itself together. That's your kid. That's your mom. That's your dad. It all links. But it doesn't, the different characteristics of, of the youth, of the moms, of the dads, that can go anyway. But there's a, there's a foundation, a DNA that sticks, and it goes from you to you to you to you to you to you. There's no doubt that this is your DNA. This is your family. So is the church. There's a foundation, and it's God's foundation. We were each uniquely made. Each church is different than the other church, but we serve Jesus. He is Lord and Savior, and there is no other way to heaven. That is, that's, that's, that's amen, amen, amen. But the different characteristics, well, we won't get into that. It's another day. Let me read this. So let's read 1 Thessalonians verse 1 through 3. Verse 1. This letter is from Paul, from Silas, from Timothy. We're writing to the church in Thessalonica to who belong. Let me put these on. Who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God give you grace and peace. Verse 2. We always thank God for all of you and pray for you. How often? Constantly. Let us be in constantly aware of our prayer walk and our prayer life. It could be a spoken prayer. It could be a silent prayer. In our everyday activities, let us be consciously aware that the Holy Spirit never leaves us. He's with us all day, every day, and just to talk to Him. Verse 3, as we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of, this is where it's very important, we think of your what? Your faithful work. What's next? your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's three blocks in that DNA solution. Let's walk through those. I'm not going to keep you a long time. The DNA, 1 Thessalonians, the Church of Thessalonica, your faithful works, your loving deeds, enduring hope. Your faithful works means spreading the gospel of Christ. And how many of us are guilty of spreading the presence of God and the anointing of God and the invitation of God to the lost? How many of us are guilty of that? Oh, I hope more than a couple. <laughs> oh, it's not a, quick, it's not a trick question. What I want you to do is like, oh, I can't raise my hand because I really haven't reached out to anybody and... I don't know how, how long. Well, that's, that's okay. You get, a, you get a pass. But here's the deal. The more you hear, the more you're accountable for. The more that you hear, the more that you're accounted. We're, we're accountable for. I want to be part of this equation. So we're responsible for faithful works, spreading the gospel. Let's read First Thessalonians. Uh, chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Now listen to this. Spreading the Word of God, spreading the gospel of Christ, I want you to keep that in the back of your, back of your mind. Verse 7, Now you have become an example for all the believers to follow throughout the provinces of Greece. From doing what? You've become an example of what? Spreading the gospel. So do we have a responsibility as Christians to spread the gospel? Wouldn't it be great? Just think of Billy Graham when he gets to heaven or when he, he's in heaven. Think about his triumphant entry into heaven. And Jesus said, hey, Pastor Bill, 
how many are here because of you? He said, I don't know, God. Well, 1,275,483. Here's a couple of crowns for you and jewels. So our responsibility is what? Church DNA. There's no getting out of it. It's what? To spread the gospel of Christ. To spread the gospel of Christ. And if you haven't spread and haven't shared, I don't want God to say, hey, how many are here because of you? Uh, three? <laughs> how many are here? Because, yeah, could you, God, I, could you say that louder? I didn't hear you. I don't want that to be one of the questions asked, and I don't have an answer for it. I really don't have anybody in mind. I don't know who's here, God. Maybe they looked over my fence and saw me singing. I'm stepping on toes because I'm stepping on mine. Sometimes we just miss it. Have you ever just missed it and knew it? Sharing the gospel with somebody as simple as, hey, how's your day going? Hey, do you have a home church? The gospel, DNA, there's no getting away from it. It's church DNA to spread the gospel of Christ. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Okay, let's move on. Verse 8, the message of the Lord has sounded out from you, not only in Greece, but its echo has been heard in every place where people are hearing about your strong faith. We don't need to brag on you. And then it goes on because you've bragged really enough by your actions. That's what it says. So what a compliment from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Look, we want you to know your exploits, your sharing the gospel of Christ has been spread throughout all of this region. And you basically, you're famous. You're famous. Thank you. Number one, DNA. Because of your faithful works. Okay, let's look at number two, faithful works. And what was that? They were known for their loving deeds. Let's read Mark 12. Well, what's the Bible say about loving deeds? Let's, <laughs> how, let me ask you this. Because I can, this because of the silence. <laughs> What's a loving deed? It's difficult, isn't it? We're going to lay down some loving deed stuff so that we'll all get it. And I think all of us are capable. I know that all of us are capable, but some of us, just because of personality, because of of just not being outgoing, are a little afraid of crowds, a little afraid of sharing. Am I correct? Yes. So let's find out about what a loving deed is. Are we responsible for that? Evidently so. Because it's in God's word. We, God, Paul, Timothy, and Silas, we are so proud and we want to encourage you because here's three pieces, three pieces to that puzzle that you have put together and done it well. Thank you, Father. Let's read Mark 12, 30 and 31. Jesus said, verse 30, and you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. How many of us have heard that before? Amen? That means everything, right? That means there's no, nothing in you that's, that's not worshiping and not loving God. And verse 31, that's the first one. That's the most important one. And all of us want to get that right. Am I correct? Love God with everything that you are. Everything that you are, every fiber of your being, love God and tell Him you love Him. But here's number two. This is where we kind of miss the boat a little bit. The second, second is equally important to the first of loving God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Ooh. Then what's it say? Read it. Okay, I want you to visualize your neighbor. No, you can't. <laughs> I 
The second is equally as important as the first. Your loving deeds to love your neighbor. No, oh, man, I just want to come to church and shout hallelujah and dance and listen to the word of God and sit down and, and not love my neighbor. But God, you don't understand what they did to me. You have no, like, you think God doesn't know what they did? He knows exactly what they did. And how many of us may think that, hey, devil, I hate you. What about God just standing back and saying, this is going to happen. Let's see how prepared they are. And unforgiveness creeps in. And then we have something else to deal with. And then bitterness steps in because of lack of forgiveness. And all of a sudden, we're in a world of hurt because we haven't forgiven somebody. We haven't loved somebody. And the Bible is very plain. Jesus said, listen, if you harbor bitterness, if you harbor, unforgi harbor unforgiveness in your heart, then I can't go before the Father and forgive you. Oh, my word. So all of a sudden, this not loving our neighbor has turned into Jesus saying to the Father, I can't forgive them because they haven't forgiven so-and-so. Well, that, that part of God's word doesn't count, right? Yes, it does. How important it is to clear the slate. To clear it. Is it DNA? Yes. Clear your unforgiveness, your bitterness, your resentment. Clear it up. This service today, get rid of bitterness because it's not worth. I'm going to just say it like it is. If, if Jesus doesn't forgive you before the Father because of bitterness in our heart, unforgiveness in our heart, so we're, we're, it just sends us to hell. This isn't a hellfire and brimstone sermon, but I'm just calling it like it is. It's unforgiveness. Okay. DNA? Okay, that one was a little tougher than the first one, right? <laughs> that was a little bit tougher. And so unforgiveness, remember, loving deeds. So what do we have here? Your faithful work of spreading the gospel, and that's not spreading the gospel for the people that you want to spread the gospel to. That means the unlovelies also. I looked up, Quincy, she's, I don't know where Quincy's at, back in class. Anyway, she's, she's a little bitty, and you can hear Lindy talking in the background. And she sang me a happy birthday song, happy birthday to Poppy. Anyway, she's a little bitty. But then she was doing a play, a Christmas play, in the church, and so Lindy sent me a video of her. Shaggy, smelly sheep. She's just a little bitty, and it's so cute. I don't even know where I was headed with that story, but it's awesome. Grandkids, squirrels, that squirrel jumped clear off of that tree. I mean, <laughs> go on. Oh, this is funny. And I, it, it is part of the DNA, unfortunately. This is, this is funny and has nothing to do with the sermon. But anyway, we were driving along in my truck, and I had the grandkids. I had a couple of the grandkids, and Quincy had her feet up on an airbag on my 2003, and it says airbag right on it. And you always hear about these airbags going off, and boom, you know, and it's like not good, like legs flying up over the head and stuff, because it's a lot of pressure involved there. Anyway, she's got her shoes up on the dash, and, and I didn't really want her shoes on my dash anyway, even if it is an 03. But, so I subtly came into that and said, hey, Quincy, you see where that says airbag right there? She says, yeah. I said, if that goes off, where are your feet going to end up? Boy, her feet slid off the dash. She said, what would it do? And I said, it would probably throw your feet up over your head. She says, really? I'm like, yeah, it would. She says, okay. She sat there for a minute. I'm going to turn this off because it's awesome. Anybody's dash. <laughs> okay, back on track. I'm going to pull it in. I'm pulling it in. I've, I've lost control here for a minute, but we're back on, back on track. Oh. <laughs> I'm trying. Okay, so we learned about unforgiveness, and, and really, this, boil this down, love God, love people. 
Love God. Love people. If you love somebody unconditionally, then, then you just you don't harbor bitterness. You don't harbor unforgiveness, and it really doesn't matter. And I'll be honest with you. There's been times when I said, you know, I've, I've forgiven stuff. And, you know, really, I didn't, and the Holy Spirit would just knock. And he knows when unforgiveness, you know what unforgiveness really is, biblical? That means your, your wishes are that they go to hell. And so I'm not talking about you're mad at your brother, you're mad at your sister, you're mad at your uncle, your aunt. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about wishing somebody would die and go to hell. Are you with me? Okay. Third, okay, so what do we have here so far? <laughs> you guys are scared. I know you are that that airbag is going to go off again. Okay. Okay, so faithful work, spreading the gospel, DNA, your loving deeds, love people. Love God. And number three, enduring hope. Biblical hope. I want you to listen to this definition. Enduring hope. A forward-looking faith. Oh, that's, that's good. How many of us are just battling today with having enough faith to just get through the day? With marriage, with kids, with resentments, with... All of the things that go along with today, it's a forward-looking faith. God, I don't see the answer today, but I know you're faithful. My hope, my prayers, my faith is that tomorrow is a better day. It's DNA. We can't stop here in the middle of something. We may be going through a trial. Have any of you ever gone through a trial? Let me ask that first. Am I the only guy in here that's ever gone through something that's devastating? Anybody else? Yeah, it, and it's not fun, is it? So right in the middle of that, a forward-looking face is biblical hope. Not to get stuck in the rut and the miry clay, a forward hope, looking forward to tomorrow. It is a confident belief based not on things experienced, but on the Word of God, that the future, he says, will happen. Hope is a future certainty that gives you joy, peace, and per- patience in the present, in the now. So did it say that the now is butterflies and Baltimore Royals? Oh, I'm not going to jump. Let's sit down. Squirrel almost got away. To find a way that this is, God, I know this is a trial. It rains on the just and the unjust. I'm going through this, God. But my hope is here because I know that your word is true. I know that your word is true. So what, what's going on right now? Trial, be it may, doesn't matter. Is it bluebirds and butterflies? No. But God, a forward-looking faith, confident belief, based not on things experiencing or experienced. Let's read Romans 8, 24 and 25. Verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. Amen. Now hope that is seen is not hope. If you see hope, how could it be you're hoping for something when you're already seeing it? Hope is for for who hopes for what he sees, question mark. Verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The Bible gives us all of the hope we need to get from today's trials and tribulations to tomorrow's patience and enduring. DNA. Praise and worship, is that part of our DNA? Spreading the gospel of Christ, is that part of the church's DNA? It's biblical. Loving our neighbors as ourselves, (laughs) is that biblical DNA? Yes. And the third, enduring hope. Because there's nothing about God that's hopeless. There's not. There's nothing about God 
that's hopeless. He has the answer to every single situation. I don't know what it is. God's answered your prayer. You may not see it today, tomorrow. It doesn't matter. He saw your heart. He, first of all, he went to lift the weight, whatever that is. Don't carry it. It's gone. Don't pick it up. Okay? All right. I love you, brother. Okay, one more scripture. Is this food for anybody? I hope so. I hope so. Okay. Romans 12, 12. Okay, this is in the English Standard Version. Rejoice in hope. This is so, so generic and so amazing. This is, this is the positive. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Did you hear that? Rejoice in hope. Tomorrow is God's day. Don't land on the experience of today. Put your eyes forward to the hope of tomorrow. Because God's word is true. I look back on, on things now, and it's amazing some of the things that my mom and dad had to deal with and go through with, with um, my situation with my leg. Different, different Anyway, and then coming up and having a family and with a wife and children and all the circumstances involved there. And have you any of you ever fretted over your family before and said, God... Has, <laughs> you know, your kids are, are one thing. and You fret over your kids and ball games and school stuff. And school stuff's awful. And, you know, kids are so mean. And, and I'm choking. Well, never mind. We're not going to do that. Anyway, um, the things that, that families have to go through. And then you have grandkids. And that's times whatever. But your kids you love, your grandkids... You, you want to protect them from everything, and it hurts. You cringe when they're hurting. They're truly hurting. To teach them to rejoice in hope for tomorrow. Because God, not just sometimes, always has the answer. To look back, testimonies, where they're from, God delivered me from this. And he brought me this. I married the prettiest girl in the state of Oklahoma. Do I deserve her? Absolutely not. Did God give her to me? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. She is beautiful. She's as beautiful and more so inside as she is outside. She has such a tender heart for God. I'm bragging on her because you, to know, those of you that don't know Laura, she's, she's one of those silent pastor's wives that leaves nothing unturned or not complete. That's who she is. You don't see her. You don't hear her. She just gets it done. Amen. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. You know what that means. That means keep your mouth shut during trial. But God, I know you. you don't understand, God, please. Get it. How about, Father, I trust you. My hope is in tomorrow. I don't see the answer today, but I know that I'm going to see it tomorrow because I trust what your word tells me. Tribulation, yes, but what am I going to learn from tribulation? The testimony of this tribulation and trial that God brings me through, the people that it's going to steer towards you, Father, because of what you did, the miraculous, the supernatural God, that you fixed this. And it caused them. Paul says, through the gospel, of, or through the supernatural signs and wonders, the gospel has been fully represented. That means that's part of our DNA, and that's coming about miracles. Where do we stand on miracles today? God is a healing God. He's a God of miracles. He's a God of restoration. He's a God of way bigger than anything that we could ever imagine. That's our God. It's not what we see. Hope is something that we don't see but we strive for. God, you're faithful. And last, be constant in prayer. You know what that means? Be constant in prayer. Do you have to need something to pray? <laughs> Stand to your feet. Isn't God good? He is so, so amazing.
constant in prayer. And you've heard this, I don't know how many times, but you need to just keep hearing it. I grew up with it. It was not fair to you guys. And maybe you had parents that did the same thing. I don't know. My mom could be, she was a horrible cook, but but when she would be preparing meals, uh, lunch, boiled pork chops, maybe. I don't know. She boiled stuff just because it was just, it got them hot, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, I totally off the subject. My mom prayed all day, every day. That's just who she was. Not out loud, boisterous, Father, I love you. When she's cooking, cleaning, sewing. I love you, Father. I love everything about you. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my husband. Thank you for my children. Thank you for my home. She used to call it her little dollhouse, 900 square feet. When I was a senior in high school, she took two of my aunts and all of their kids in because of abuse in, in upstate New York. And that little 900-square-foot house and a, just a little powder room bathroom with a shower had 11 people staying in it. 11. Count them. But you know what? My mom never shifted gears. She not one time did I ever hear her complain she went to the carpet store. That's back when Shag Carpet. Anybody remember Shag? <laughs> hey, it was in, brother, when it was in. <laughs> you win. <laughs> she, she would go to the, the carpet store and just get the remnants. And the upstairs, it wasn't, it was just attic. She went upstairs and put insulation um, in the in the ceiling and put plywood down. Mom did this, put plywood down. She got cardboard from scrap bins around town. She would cut cardboard pieces and makeshift insulation. That's really all we had money for. And then she, on top of the plywood, made all kinds of different patterns with all the different color shags. And it was it was actually amazing. It was art. It was artwork. But she did all of that so we could house 11 people in that little house. Had pull down stairs and a string that you could close your own stairs and, and then you got your own attic space. She never once complained. She saw the situation here and her hope was God somehow that they can be restored because they've been abused. Let me be a light and a beacon in this situation. How many of us would have, well, bless God. 900 square foot home. There's no way in the world that's ever going to happen. You understand the this, this, this shower sequence we're going to have to have? That's unbelievable. What if three people have to go to the bathroom at the same time? None of that. Of course, my dad made a shower schedule. Some of them were like 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but I got first dibs. Listen, I'm the son. I get dibs. So what's that tell us? What's enduring hope? Rejoicing in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. In other words, I'm just going to say it, straighten up a little bit. This is DNA. This is how the church is supposed to be. Just straighten up a little. You're not doing anything horribly wrong. And trust me, I'm, I'm... (laughs) <laughs> I've, I've got quirks. Anybody understand that? Anybody that knows me well, I've, I've got some stuff that I deal with all the time. That's just me. It's my personality. It's what I've been gifted with. The Holy Spirit is steering me from tree to tree sometimes, steering me. Because our church DNA is what we stand on. That DNA is God's Word. This is truth. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads. Let's go home. Father, we love you. We thank you for healing virtue in this house today, God. We thank you, Father, for relationships being restored. We thank you for children coming home. We thank you, God, there was a heavy blanket anointing today. We understand, God, you send those for a reason that lives be changed. And we can hear the testimony of what you, what you, God, what your prayer and what you've done by your spirit, God, in lives. Healing. Healing. And we thank you, God, for church DNA. 
that we understand what we're truly responsible for as Christians. God, it's not just fly by night, get me to heaven. God, it's, hey, look, to be the, to, the Christian that I want you to be a Christian, to be the spiritual leader, the spiritual father, the spiritual, spiritual mentor that I've called you and gifted you to be, I need you to understand that there's some guidelines and it's DNA and it's everything that I've got in my word that applies to you as Christians. And it's all good. It's all good. So we thank you for that, God, for confirming your word. We thank you, Father, for all that you do. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name. And all the people said, amen. amen. God bless you.